Well, good morning, church. I'm Wes Sladig. I'm one of the elders here at River Valley, and I am excited to share from God's Word with you this morning. So if you would, please open your Bible to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be taking a look at um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Again, that's chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that the elders of your church, we pray every day for the members of this church. And in a sense, this passage is personal to me because this is the the, uh, passage I use to pray over our people. So my hope this morning is that you'll not only hear clearly from God's word, but that you will leave knowing how you specifically are prayed for and how you're being prayed for. So I'm going to start reading these verses. I'm going to start in verse 15, and then I will pray for us. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for your holiness, for your power, your greatness, your love. We're grateful for the love that you have shown to us in your son, Jesus. And we just pause right now to recognize you and who you are. Lord, we're thankful for Christ and that we have access to you, Father, through him. And Lord, we're also thankful for your Holy Spirit. So we pray that your spirit would open our hearts today, would open our minds to receive your word so that you would be glorified so we can live lives that are faithful to you. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So as we look at this text, it's important that we keep a few things in mind, but most importantly, remember that Paul is is, uh, writing Ephesians while he's being imprisoned in Rome. So any idea that he would be inspired in the human sense of the term to pen these words go out the window. He was imprisoned. He was not experiencing the comforts of life. And yet, as with all Scripture, Scripture is inspired. It's God-breathed. God accomplishes his purpose, his purposes, no matter what the circumstances of the person writing the, writing the letter. But the lesson here, I think, can be summed up in another of Paul's letters, uh, which he also wrote from prison. That's in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, where he writes these words. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In, every, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, the point of it is, is this. For those of us who are in Christ, no matter what our circumstances may be, no matter how much they may change, it doesn't change the unmoving, the constant reality of Jesus. And we can have hope and joy and contentment no matter what our circumstances because our ultimate hope transcends this life here and now, looks to the unseen, and our hope is wrapped up in the fixed work of the cross. And this is the same hope which allows Paul to write with such depth and joy, even in the context of being a prisoner. But as we look into these verses, I think we first have to give at least a brief summary of what came before it, and what came before it were verses 3 through 14, and that's another long sentence of Paul's. 
And there are a number of key truths that we can glean from there. Uh, but if it were to be summarized, it would be this. The blessing receivers receive, the blessing believers receive from their union with Christ. Specifically, I'm just going to list out a few here, but we're told here that believers receive every spiritual blessing through Christ. There's not one thing we're missing. The Father has given us everything through Jesus. We're chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless and that we've been adopted as sons through Christ and this is according to the purpose of his will and this adoption only happens through the blood of Christ it's his blood that forgives us our sins that makes us right with the father that redeems us and this is all due to the riches of God's grace which he lavished upon us and we see that Christ came in the fullness of time to accomplish this purpose and to unite all things in him and through Christ, we as believers have an inheritance. It's purposed and predestined by him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And we who hope in Christ will be to the praise of his glory. And by hearing the gospel and believing it, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this is a guarantee of our inheritance until that day when we will acquire it fully. And this section ends with pointing out that it's all to the glory of God. There's no room for us to take any of, our, any of it ourselves. It's all by his mercy and grace through Jesus, and it's important that we remember this as we look at this. I think we can also see from these verses that God has worked out our salvation. There is an order to it. We can see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all present in our salvation in these verses. It's not as if God had to go to a plan B to reconcile us to himself. No, the truth is that God purposed that salvation should happen the way it did. If there's one verse I would encourage you to go home and dwell on, it'd be in verse 4 there, where it says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So long before the world was in existence, long before any of us were here, God chose us in Christ. So we have to keep these in mind to make full sense of the the verses that follow and the verses that we're looking at here this morning because it's only because of this grand hope that Paul has reason to express thankfulness, joy, and confidence in the midst of his circumstances. And the same is true of us who believe in Christ today as well. It's a truth that doesn't change and it's something that we should praise God for. The Father accomplishes his purpose in Christ. It's not due to anything we do or can contribute it's simply out of his mercy to us. So Paul's aim is to help the church at Ephesus grasp the fullness of these blessings they have received. And I think it's worth noting here that Paul's prayer to the people follows his praise to God and not the other way around. And I think the beauty of this passage and all scripture in general is that it gives us a pattern to follow in our own lives. We're first to praise God for his glory, for who he is, for the spiritual blessings he's given us in Christ. And then second, we petition the Spirit's help so we can more fully comprehend these truths. We should not make the mistake of being hasty in coming to God, immediately asking him what we need. We first need to recognize who we are talking to, that we are talk, talking to God himself, that we should pause and take a moment to be silent before him. I think as we work through these verses, you'll see this pattern modeled for us. So look at verse 15 and 16. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So a couple things we see here. First, this is a very specific faith that Paul is giving thanks for. It's not something in the abstract or theoretical. It's a very specific faith in the Lord Jesus. And we know that this faith, ha this faith has implications for our lives and for the lives of the believers in Ephesus. As, we, as we've been reading through our study in Acts, um, we know that Ephesus was a city that was filled with witchcraft and magic and superstition. And as we read just a few weeks ago in Acts 19, um, after the men who tried to unsuccessfully exercise a demon out of a man in Jesus' name, many of these people went cold turkey, so to speak, on their former way of life 
And in Acts 19.19, 19, it reads this, just listen. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So again, it was a specific faith in the Lord Jesus. It implied a rejection of the believers in Ephesus of their former ways of living. And we can see this on display very obviously in this passage of Acts. And I think if you just think about it in our own day, when you think about brothers and sisters in, in Christ who come to faith in cultures where they know there will be division, sometimes extreme division, sometimes it may even cost them their life. And we need to, to think about this. But it shouldn't surprise us because Christ himself tells us that he will be a dividing line. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 35, we read this. These are Jesus' words. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So the point is, when we come to Christ, it's never going to be a private matter. Rather, it's going to be a faith that changes the way we live to the point to where the people around us will notice. So I think we have to ask ourselves some questions here. Do the people closest to us know that we love Christ? Do they know that we have parted ways with the world because of our union with Christ? No matter what that cost may be. You see, this is the constant example that Scripture gives us. It's an example of unwavering commit, commitment to Christ no matter how it might negatively impact our physical well-being. I think we also notice here this is a faith that expresses 100% reliance on Jesus and nothing else, and certainly nothing in ourselves. It solely rests, it's solely on Christ that we place our help, our hope. And this is the reason Paul does not cease to give thanks to them. His words are meant to be an encouragement to them to keep on going, that they would know their struggle in this life doesn't come close to both their present and their future blessings in Christ. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on. We see that this faith in Christ naturally leads towards a love toward all the saints, God's people. And the question you have to think about is this. How could you not love those who have made the same profession of faith in Christ that you have? Those who have said, no to the world, and yes to Christ. There's a natural connection we have with other believers because there's no other bond in the world that will be deeper than this. I think about in my own life, and perhaps you can relate, is certain people that, who are just on a purely human level I would really not have a whole lot in common with, but because of our same profession of faith in Christ, we're united. And that's what this is talking about. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, do I love the saints? Do I love God's people to the extent that Paul lays out in this passage and in all of his letters? Do you consistently pray for your church and his people? These are things we need to consider and wrestle with and work out in our own minds. So we can look at these two things, faith in the Lord Jesus and a love toward all the saints, and we can look at these as the, almost as the two hallmarks or tests or proofs of an authentic Christian. And it's almost as if Paul boils it down for us to these two basics, faith in the Lord Jesus and a love toward all the saints. These are going to be the two things that characterize Christians for all times. I think it's also worth emphasizing the obvious here that this is a prayer that's for believers. It's not for the world. It's for the believers at Ephesus post-conversion. And Paul is praying that these people would become more fully aware of the blessings that they have in Christ. As believers, it's a dangerous place that we get to if we ever feel that we have arrived or that we have knowledge and a sense of superiority or arrogance for the knowledge that we have. There's always room for us to grow in our knowledge of God and that knowledge leads to a deep, intimate relationship with him. Okay, so what does Paul specifically pray for? Well, as I alluded to earlier, we first need to look at who he is praying to. So look at the first part of verse 
17 there, it reads this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, Paul starts with this, and we see this spread out throughout, throughout the New Testament as well. Just listen to these verses. Romans 15, 6, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself in John 20, verse 17, and talking with Mary after his resurrection, said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am sending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So again, when we pray, Scripture shows us that we first must pause and recognize who we are talking to. We are talking to God himself, the Holy and Glorious One. So when you come to pray, don't rush into it without acknowledging who you're talking to. Don't get immediately right into what you need. We need to first pause and thank God for himself. And then when we come to prayer, we come to him knowing that we have access to him because of Jesus. We have access to him through his son. And all of God's blessings to us come to us through Jesus and him alone. Think about this. Jesus, right now at this very moment, is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Romans 8.34 reads this, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Hebrews 7.25, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So I can't emphasize enough the truth that Jesus' current position is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you, being your advocate. And we need to let this reality sink into our bones. When you're tempted to lose hope, come back to God's word and be reminded of his promises to us in Christ. Personally, for me, it gave me such great encouragement and hopefulness that as I prepared for today, that Christ himself was at the right hand of the Father interceding for me being my advocate, that you would hear the word of the Lord clearly. And the same is true for you. Christ is there interceding for you. This is Christ's current position. So I want, yourself to, I want you to ask yourself this question, this question. Where in your life are you losing hope? Are you throwing yourself on this truth that Jesus himself prays for you? Where are you losing hope? You see, our call as Christians is to be overwhelmed by this truth in the midst of whatever is going on in our life, whatever circumstances we're going through. Paul also adds there, the Father of glory. And this reminds us that God is both infinitely glorious and holy, but that he also comes near to save us by his son, Jesus. One commentator puts it this way, the God of glory is not to be trifled with, nor is he to be kept at a distance. He is rich in mercy and kind to sinners, and he has come near to us in his holy son. So God is holy. We are not. There's a great distance between us and God. There's a great chasm, and yet we can still approach him through Christ. He's not far from us. He's not uninterested in our dire position. Rather, he gave us his son so that we could be reconciled to him. So looking at the rest of verse 17 and in the first part of verse 18 there, He prays that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. So Paul's request here starts generally at a high-level overview, and as we'll see, he'll move to the particular request in the next few verses. But Paul starts at this point, that they would be given the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. 
And this is a reference to the Holy Spirit and Paul's request specifically is that the spirit of truth would give them wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of God and he prays that the spirit would work in each of their lives to illuminate the truth of his word and to further solidify in their hearts the victory that they have in Christ. And I find it interesting here to observe what Paul doesn't pray for. He doesn't pray for things like physical safety, material well-being, etc. Now, those are all good things to pray for. We should. But as a matter of first importance, he starts with the spiritual. And we know that this culture was one that was hostile to God. And there was uh, undoubtedly needs such as uh, these that were pressing to the believers in Ephesus. Yet despite those needs, the greatest need they had to know was God the greatest need that they had was to know God more deeply, more intimately. They needed this so they could live faithful, steadfast lives to the end. And this is true of us as well. It's true of all Christians at all times. And it's because the life of obedience can never be lived if we don't have a deep love and knowledge of him who created us to be holy like him. And I also just want you to think about for a moment the fact that we can know God. I know I have been prone to not dwell on this and to glaze over this in my life, and maybe it's the same for you. Maybe you've never sat long enough to comprehend that you can know the one who created the world and everything in it, that you can know the one who created you. And I want to be clear, it's not just a matter of knowing facts, knowing things about God but it's knowing God personally. And Paul's prayer is that these Ephesians would know God in that personal and real way, not just in the sense of having information about him, but knowing him from their heart. And we would all do well to sit sit and think about this and praise God for it. And it's only possible by the Spirit's help that we can know God. And so Paul prays, that the Spirit would enlighten these believers, but he doesn't just pray for enlightenment's sake, it's for a very specific purpose that they be enlightened, and it's so that they would comprehend certain spiritual realities. And this is where Paul gets into the particulars of his prayer. And namely, he prays that they would know three things, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Let's start with that first one, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Well, this hope that God called the Ephesians to specifically was the gospel. It was not a hope they conjured up on their own. It was God's hope. It was a hope that they were not only forgiven in Christ, but they were reconciled to God. In the second chapter of this same letter, verses 12 through 13, reads this. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So it's not, again, that this was a better form of hope, building upon something that was already established, we always have to remember that apart from Christ, there is no hope. And Paul's prayers, Paul's prayer is that these believers would have the assurance of their hope in Christ and to know it deeply. And it should bring us such encouragement that we don't have to wonder if we can trust this hope. And the reason we don't have to wonder is because it's been fixed and accomplished by what's happened on the cross. Hebrews calls it a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. So the question you have to ask yourself is, do you know this hope? Again, I'm not speaking about just head knowledge, but do you know it deep in your soul? Is it a hope that you stake everything on? Or are you placing your hope, even if it's just a little bit of it, in something or someone else? Scripture is clear that God called us in Christ. Place all your hope in that truth. Second, that you may know what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And this is a reference to the inheritance God will give to his people. But first notice that it's out of God's riches that he gives us this inheritance. God's mercy and grace to us in Christ is not lacking. 
It's not as if he had just enough to give us or he gave us out of the last remnants or he had to scrounge something up to get it to us. No, it was out of his riches. Colossians 1.12 tells us that the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And so notice that it's God who does the qualifying, not man. And what exactly is the inheritance? Well, it's that we've been transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of of his beloved son. Later in Acts, in chapter 26, when Paul is before King Agrippa and he's sharing about his experience on the road to Damascus, um, he's sharing that uh, the commission he received from Jesus and that it was to appoint him as a witness to the Gentiles so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God to receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified, sanctified by faith in Christ. But I think maybe the, the most stunning vision of what our inheritance will look like can be seen in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. And just listen to these verses and think about this. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So as believers, this is our inheritance. This is our destiny. Think about these things. And then third, he prays that they would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And I think here, hopefully you're noticing at this point the, the words that Paul uses. He's stacking word upon word here to try to describe the blessings we have from God, but yet they seem to still be lacking. The greatness of God's power can't be measured. It's incomprehensible. But notice that this power is not just referencing something in the future. It's something being directed towards believers now And while we as believers can take great hope and confidence that our salvation provides for us a future blessed beyond description, we must never forget that it gives us great hope and confidence right now in the present. And instead of being overwhelmed by our present circumstances, good or bad, our call as believers is to be overwhelmed by the power directed towards us by the Father. And we need to know this power because it's a spiritual battle we are in. As was mentioned here earlier in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul reminds the people of Ephesus that their battle is not just against flesh and blood, but it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And the fact is, is that we need to know this power so we can stand strong as Christians, strong and firm, to have a fear, to have a faith that fears God more than it fears people. And also notice that this, is, this power is for all who believe. It's not just for a select group of super-Christians. It's for all who place their faith in Christ. All who place their faith in Christ have this incomprehensible power of God directed to them, from the weakest to the strongest. And we need this power to ensure that the hope inheritance we've just read about would be sure things to us, that we'd be convinced in our minds and it's only by the power of God that we sinners can be saved from our sin and reconciled to our holy God. And it's because of this power that we can persevere to the end. Well, what else do we know about this power? The rest of verse 19 and into verse 20 tells us this power is according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So the power that Paul is praying the Ephesians would know is the same that, rise, that, that raised Christ out of the grave. The pinnacle of this, of this power is displayed in Christ's resurrection. It's God raising Christ from the dead. And this is the strongest reminder for believers that death has been defeated in Christ. It's validation. And this powerful work of God was something the Ephesians needed to know so they could have courage and bravery 
And this power also displays God's supremacy. No other power could do this. No other magic or superstition in Ephesus could produce power. And just like the Ephesians, we need to know this power as well. Have you dwelt on the fact of the same power that God displayed in the resurrection of Christ is directed towards you as a believer? And again, I come back to this. Where in your life are you losing hope and becoming discouraged. What would it look like right now if this power overwhelmed your despair and discouragement? And you see, this is why we need to constantly come back to God's word. It's fixed, it doesn't change, it's our anchor. We need to come back to it and let the word of God encourage us. And you see, Christ's death, Christ conquered death by his resurrection but he also conquered sin and the devil. We talk about this every time we do communion. We use almost these same words. And this is what the hope of our salvation hinges on, that Christ, defeating death and evil, he gives us his righteousness so that we can have hope despite our sin and that we will be joint heirs of Christ. And, you know, I just think about the disciples and the effect that this power had on them when... We read in the gospel accounts that as Jesus was arrested and crucified, they all deserted him. They deserted him in fear. And yet we know that all of them, with the, sec with the exception of John, they died a martyr's death. So it just raises the question is, how do you go from fleeing in fear to preserve your life to dying for that very thing that you fled from and to living a life that doesn't fear death any longer? A life characterized by love, boldness, courage and the answer is they were transformed by God's power directed towards them in Christ and what Paul is saying here is that the same power directed to the Ephesian believers is directed towards us as well we also know there from the rest of verse 20 that this same power seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places and we looked at this earlier but it's well worth repeating that Christ's current location is in heaven it's his current location right now it's not future it's right now it's where he is seated he's completed his earthly mission he's finished his work on earth fulfilling his purpose and he now reigns in power first peter 3 22 tells us that all things have been su subjected to him christ is seated at the right hand and this means that he is in the place of ultimate honor and favor and authority he is on the throne right now. We, we also see an amazing set of verses just ahead of us here in Ephesians chapter 2 that I want us to think about for a moment, starting in verse 4 of chapter 2. And it reads this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when, when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with them and seated us with them in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so we who have put our faith in Christ for salvation, for the forgiveness of our sins to be reconciled to the Father, we are raised with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. Now, obviously, we won't take the same place of significance as Christ does at the right hand. That specific place of honor is solely reserved for him. But the point is that our inheritance is with Christ in the heavenly places. And because of this, we don't have to fear death because our life is wrapped up in his life, in Christ. And his resurrection proves this to us. Again, it's the validation. And we can and should take great comfort that Christ is currently ruling and reigning at this very moment. So Christ is at the right hand of the Father. Look at verse 21. It tells us that Christ is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Paul here is emphasizing the supremacy of Jesus. And it's a supremacy that extends over everything, now and forever. The truth is, is that Christ is our King. Do you think of Jesus the same way that Paul does? It's obvious that Paul is overwhelmed by the majesty and power and greatness of him. And the call of us and the call of every Christian 
is to have this same view of Christ, to esteem him in such a way that only one powerful word after another can be used to describe him, and even then it falls short. But this is how Paul does it. Christ has authority and dominion over everything and everyone, now and forever. And the full reality of this rule is yet to come, but for believers, the same power of God that placed Christ in this place of rule and authority is directed towards us. Verse 22, and he puts all things under his feet. Here Paul is quoting Psalm 8, 6, which reads, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under feet, under his feet. Psalm 110, verse 1 also comes to mind here where he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So again, Christ's current position guarantees that his victory is certain. And again, even though Christ's full reign won't be completely realized until his return, it does not change the nature that it is certain and that he is in a position of ultimate authority at this present moment, right at this moment. And so this gives us great confidence. It gives us joy that our king is not one who will be king temporarily or that his throne will be overtaken by another to come after him. No, it's eternal. It's an eternal throne. So we get into the last few verses of this passage. I love how it ends because it should give us great encouragement as a body of Christ, as the people of God. Look at the second part of verse 22 through the end of verse 23. It says that he, God, he being God, put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ alone is the head of the church. We are his body. So this naturally implies that if we become disconnected from the head, We can no longer be the body. We can call ourselves something else, but we're no longer, by definition, the body of Christ. This is the church, and this is what makes the church unique from every other organization, any other group in the world. It's that we come together each Sunday to proclaim our faith in the risen Lord Jesus, specifically that he came to the earth to save his people from their sins, that he died the death we deserved, even though he was perfect and sinless and that he was raised from the dead by God, defeating sin and death, and he now rules and reigns in power. And he will come again. This is the church. And Christ is our head. And he loves his church and he fills it all in all. I think it's also interesting to note here that while Christ has dominion over everything, only the church is called his body. It's only the church and he rules it. And the church is held in such high esteem here, and it's because Christ fills the church. So, question, do you, love, do you hold the church in the same view? Do you esteem it in the same way that these verses are showing to us? You see, we must never forget that the church, both universal and this church, River Valley, it's his. We are not to take ownership of it, but we are to take stewardship of it. We are here to be found faithful in the time and place, the specific time and place that God has placed us. There are those who in this church have went before us who were faithful in the time and place and in the place of history that they lived, and we are to do the same. And, and when we do this, we're going to glorify God, and we will honor Christ, but we're also going to set an example for those who come after us. And I mean specific to this church. Think about River Valley 50 years in the future if God wills it. And will those people 50 years in the future here in this church be able to say, look back on us and say, those were our faithful ancestors who went before us. They loved Christ. They loved his church and they cherished his word. This is the challenge before us. And that's the question that we have is, will we love Christ, his church, and his word? Will we do that in a way that future generations of Christians at this church can look back at us as a people whose example is worth following? Personally, do you love Christ with an unwavering commitment the way Paul does and the way he prays the people in Ephesus would? Do you love the church? Do you love the people of God? Are you committed to it? 
And do you cherish his word? And do you love it and diligently study it to the best of your ability? In closing here this morning, what I'd like to do is read another prayer of Paul's in Ephesians chapter 3. And um, my hope is, is that as you hear these words, you leave with today with, with having an assurance of your faith that you would again be reminded of the love of God, the faithfulness of Christ, and the Spirit's presence in your life, that you do, you do not need to be tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea, but that you would be solid and unwavering. So as I read these words in closing, I'd like for you to just bow your head and close your eyes and listen to this prayer and think about these words. For this reason, we bow our knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant us to be strengthened with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to you who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to you be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.